The patriotism and courage of the 442nd Infantry Regiment is a seldom told story. The Army unit was made up almost entirely of second generation Japanese Americans during World War II. While the soldiers faced fire on the battlefield, their families were back home, being forced into internment camps and losing businesses. Facing the Mountain by Boys in the Boat author Daniel Brown details the lives of four heroes, three who fought on the battlefield and one who stayed behind to fight for the constitutional rights of all Americans. So the book actually weaves together um, the personal stories of four young men. These are all Nisei second generation Americans who came of age early in the World War II period. Those young men all pretty much universally faced the same dilemma. Their families were being incarcerated. They were being forced from their homes. They were having to walk away from their schools. They lost businesses as they were shipped off to these camps. At the same time, lots of these young men, like millions of other young American men, felt that they should do something to serve their country. So the question arose amongst them, what is the right thing to do? Should I resist this government that is doing this to my family? Mm -hmm. Or should I enlist in the military and try to serve the country in that way? And, and so it sort of focuses on four young men who I think sort of typify how Nisei men made it through that period, but also just four young men that I thought were really interesting, compelling, earnest young men trying to do the right thing. The book is not just about the soldiers, really. It's their families back home, the values instilled. How did those aspects of life shape the way these men viewed sacrifice? It shaped them a great deal. Um, these young men, although they grew up in mostly in typically American circumstances and thought of themselves entirely as American, nevertheless, they had Japanese parents. And so some of the values were shaped by their parents. And among those values, particularly among the young men that I was writing about, there were you know, notions of honor. For instance, as they went off to war, almost universally, these young men's fathers said to them something along the lines of, well, do well, fight well, I hope you come back safe, but what, it, what above all, don't bring shame on the family. And, and that's a heavy burden, of course, for a young man to carry. I think it made them exceptionally good fighters when it did come to actual combat. Out of those four central figures, was there one story that left a particularly strong impression on you? One does stand out from the others, of course. Three of them are young men who volunteered to serve for the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was this all Japanese American fighting unit that was formed in 1943. But the fourth of them, Gordon Hirabayashi from Seattle, took a very different path. What Gordon did was there was a curfew imposed on anybody of Japanese ancestry in Seattle, whether American or not, an 8 p.m. curfew was imposed. When he realized the curfew was in effect, he was a student at UW, he decided he just wasn't going to obey it. And he actually began to document times when he was staying out past 8 p.m., and then when it came time for Japanese Americans in Seattle to get on the buses and being taken away to these camps, Gordon just didn't do it. He just refused to get on the bus. And instead, he sat down and he wrote this long, carefully reasoned statement explaining why he thought that both the curfew and the incarcerations were wrong and illegal and unconstitutional. And he took that statement, he went downtown Seattle and he turned himself in at the FBI offices in Seattle, uh, handed them the statement and was taken into custody. And that of course led to a whole court uh, battle that went on throughout the, the war years. Daniel, when you look at Gordon Hirabayashi's sacrifice and the immense toll I'm sure it took on his life, what can we learn from that? 
with Gordon, we see another face of courage. The other young men I'm talking about here, you'll see undeniable courage on the battlefield. But for me, Gordon is in some ways the greatest teacher in the book. He was in and out of jails and prisons throughout the war as a consequence of the stand that he took. But that stand that he took was in defense of very obvious constitutional rights that should be available to all Americans. And so what I learned from him is that, although sometimes you may pay a heavy price uh, initially, it's still sometimes necessary to take a very principled stand against something that you feel is fundamentally wrong, or in this case, fundamentally un-American. And that's what it came down to for Gordon. If you would mind telling us what the title means, unless, of course, I know some authors would like the reader to discover the title within the book. Um, would you would you mind sharing that? Particularly draft age young men right after Pearl Harbor and their families, they had been going about their lives, uh, you know, as everybody else had been until December 7th, 1941 and the attack on Pearl Harbor. And immediately after that attack, there arose a mountain of problems in their paths. They had to find a way over that mountain or around that mountain, but it was there blocking their paths forward to be towards becoming Americans, towards getting through college, towards their business prospering or whatever it was. There was this huge set of problems that just landed right in front of them, blocking their way. And so, as I say, on sort of a metaphorical level, that's what the title means to me. I think readers are also going to discover that um, in the military part of it, the soldiers in the 442, the all Japanese unit, as a practical matter, they were always fighting their way up the side of some mountain or another in Europe. The Germans always held the high ground. They were always having to fight uphill against a uh, fire that was coming downhill at them. Yeah. What do you hope readers take from this? You know, I think particularly in this time we're in right now, when there's a lot of anti-Asian rhetoric and sentiment and outright hatred floating around out there, I hope and kind of think that readers who learn about these four young men and their families, when they get to know these guys and their families and learn about their immigrant parents' experience coming to this country, see all that they went through in order to become Americans, see what it was like to have their livelihoods taken away, see the sacrifices that they made, even laying down their lives for the country. I really believe if you take history and make it personal, people start to care and understand and relate to it on a human level. And so I'm hoping that as people read the book and they come to know these guys and their families, that that's what happens, that it opens up more understanding. And a portion of the sales of Facing the Mountain will go to Den Show, a Seattle-based nonprofit dedicated to collecting, preserving, and sharing Japanese-American history, as well as promoting social justice and equity. If you've never gotten the chance to visit Den Show, the website there, I strongly suggest you do so. There is so much valuable history there.